All right, guys, welcome back to a QA, and a and as always, you're with me. Lyndon. <laughs> <laughs> and we have Danny Lennon uh, joining us today. He's come down under, so we're doing this one uh, in person, and we're very honoured to have him here. Welcome, Danny. Thank you so much for having me. And guys, uh, if you're interested, you can buy this limited edition one-off Sharpie microphone. Uh, Danny's touched it. Touch it, Danny. There you go. See? And now it's worth even more. So if you're interested, uh, you can place a bid. Email mentorship at jpshealthandfitness.com.au. But let's get into the questions. And first up, we have Emily. Emily Purdy uh, has asked, Jacob, as a coach, I'm sure you have had clients previously who are overweight, unhappy in themselves, and come to you ready to change their lifestyle and habits. Most of these clients take everything on board and implement it to the best of their knowledge and abilities. On occasion, we deal with clients who are smart, train hard, and know exactly what they need to do to change to get results. They ask questions, request extra resources, but for one reason or another, they aren't getting results as they don't appear to implement any of it outside of their sessions. Jacob, how have you as a coach overcome this type of behavior in the past, and what stance would you take with this type of stubborn clients? So, we'll uh, obviously address this uh, individually. Anyone want to take the reins here? Danny? I'm happy to try. Uh, so, essentially, this question gets at the biggest difficulty that you'll probably face coaching for anyone is the problem of how do you get someone to do what you think they should do? Because to some degree, it's the, the easier part is knowing what strategy would get someone a certain result in an ideal world if they were to follow it. But getting them to follow it, particularly from a nutrition standpoint, can be extremely difficult. And it's why we talk so much about someone's compliance with the diet, their daily habits and behaviors and so on. So this is frequently gonna be a problem you're gonna face. And a few ways that may help either mitigate that or prevent that in the first place. So the first one is just an understanding of why someone isn't able to stick to a particular type of intervention. So this could be an issue on your end as a coach first, so that's the first place to start. Is this overly restrictive to the point that it's too difficult? Does this not align with what is possible for this person given their, um, let's say, their, their budget, socioeconomic status, their lifestyle, their work schedule, and so on? Is it incompatible with any of those that's going to make it more difficult? Um, if all of those things are checked and you think you have a good structure that should be able to be uh, someone to stick to, they seem to want to make change but are unable to do so, then the next is probably, well, what else is causing them to do things that are going against those ideas? And this is where you'd start to look at, well, what is the environment they're surrounding themselves in? So this could be their food environment. If they are at home have lots of treat foods left on the counter or, or in easy sight or is easy to access, then it's going to make it much more likely that they're going to turn to that in times where willpower wanes and so on. Uh, it could be certain peer groups that they're in. It could be certain habits and uh, behaviors that they currently have that are going to make it more difficult to stick to. So trying to really ask questions to see what they're doing. And then if you take care of all those things and it's still not possible, then probably trying to drill down with questioning of why does this person want to make change in the first place? And I often talk about trying to get leverage on that person. So going beyond their surface goal of they want to lose a few pounds, what is the real reason for wanting to do that? What will that benefit from them in their life? What's the greater things that they will get from that? Because more than losing a few pounds or dropping a gene size, that's going to give them things like confidence, more self-esteem, more ability to go into cer certain social situations that they want to, um, feel good about themselves, get a feeling of accomplishment, all these types of things that will differ from person to person. But if you get them to realize those, first that will create leverage, then the second part is like we said, set up their environment, that's going to increase the likelihood they can stick to it, then have some clear goals, and then beyond that we can get into a ton of other stuff uh, later on maybe, but that would be of how hard or restrictive you may have to be with some people. Some people need clear set rules that will work well, other people can get away with more flexibility. So there are some places I would start with and hopefully that's answered something. Yeah, so something I would say on this is, firstly, well, I agree with everything Danny said, 
because I'm blindly loyal to him and um, something important to consider that may not address the question specifically is just to how do you conceptualize yourself as a coach what is your philosophy what service do you provide speaking personally I am not a motivator style coach I will provide my best insight I will provide hopefully solutions or methods to tackle whatever problem we are trying to solve but at the end of the day people people tend to not want to change as much as what they think they want to change and if I realize I've run into that roadblock I will just speak openly and honestly with the client and say look I just don't think you are willing to give up say what it requires to achieve this goal um and yeah the client tends to just need to understand that just because they're coming to you doesn't mean you can you don't have the ability to you're not omnipotent you cannot just help them achieve whatever they want because there's been some kind of financial transaction so i guess that is all i just i just get you to consider that what kind of coach are you? If you are the kind of coach that is a motivator, someone that just stays on top of clients, just constantly checks in, being like, hey, you doing this? Hey, you doing this? Are you constantly progressing towards goals? <coughs> that is fine. <clears throat> but if you're not one of those coaches, I wouldn't exhaust yourself of your own personal resources trying to help someone who just may not be in a position of where they do want to change. Yeah, as I said. I completely agree with everything Danny said. And because I'm not loyal or blindly loyal to Lyndon, I'm going to give you a less pessimistic, uh, I guess, perspective of coaching. <laughs> um, but I, no, but in all seriousness, I do agree with uh, investing your resources into clients uh, up until a point. You know, simple things like a three strike rule, for example, if you're continually having the same issues over and over, um, there's no point putting time, energy, and emotional uh, resources into a person if they don't want to change. But uh, I think you should try because I do believe people can change um, and that if we approach things uh, you know, in, a, in an appropriate way, we can increase a, their likelihood of success. So building on top of what Danny addressed, which was obviously assessing the diet plan itself um, and their environment, uh, I think the next step from there is to look at how you can modify their behavior. And obviously, uh, their environments and their lifestyle, things like this play a big role. Um, but so too does the instruction uh, and the strategies that you implement with the behaviors. If you're focusing only on outcomes with these stubborn clients, like weight loss, um, you know, did you hit your calories and macros? That's not very useful to a lot of people. And like Danny mentioned, uh, beginners especially are going to need more constraints, rules, and tighter confines um, on the instructions that you give. They need things to be black and white with minimal shades of grey. Um, you know, people who are experienced have a lot of knowledge. If you give them shades of grey, they can make sense of it and you know get to the get the job done. Uh, but when you're working with people who are struggling uh, to get the ball rolling in terms of their lifestyle and habits. I think it's really useful to give them specific behavioural strategies that address uh, their overt behaviours, which are the behaviours we can see, because there are a lot of behaviours we can't see, which are covert behaviours, um, but we can't really modify this because we don't really know what's going on for the most part, unless you live with your client, which I doubt is happening. Um, and when it comes to modifying overt behaviours, we have excess and deficit behaviours. So we have excess, things that they're doing too much of, and deficit behaviours, things they're not doing enough of. Um, so in this case, if you have a client who just can't get things done, you have to look at, well, are there excess behaviours and how do we modify those? Well, typically we need to eliminate them or replace them with a competing response. Uh, and in the case that they have uh, deficit behaviours, we need routine, reminders, uh, structure, um, all of these sorts of things uh, so that they can implement them. And they need skill and experience, so practising uh, these things over time so they get better at it and it becomes habituated. Um, so I think if you look at it like that and you have a, a strategy and a process for assessing the effectiveness of a strategy and you go through things uh, from, I guess, the most uh, detrimental behaviours uh, and the most beneficial behaviours, or you could start the other way around and start with very small incremental uh, behaviour changes 
Um, I'm not an expert in this area, but um, I think both have utility in different contexts. Um, so yeah, just try to modify the behaviors and be patient. Try with each client because they're hiring you for a reason. And like Linda said, if you're not a coach whose philosophy is you know built on being a motivator and getting results, you know, with everyone you work with, in the sense that uh, you know results being defined as physical transformations per se or weight loss uh, transformations, uh, then you might need not need to go down the route as uh, assertively as what um, you know you may need to go down if you're somebody who just trying to educate and help people understand things a little bit better um, you know as Lyndon does that's what he tries to do is teach people whereas I on the other hand I want to get results and I want to see people change and improve uh, their lives their situations and to get what they came for really um, so I will push things a little bit more to try and get them to change um, to a degree I guess uh, yeah, that's uh, my answer on that. I hope we all helped you better understand that uh, situation. Um, question number two is from Amanda. If you have a beginner client who has no idea about macros or creating meal plans, besides them learning to develop self-created meal plans in time with experience of trial and error, or without having a dietetics degree, what system do you have in place to optimize their nutrition? Danny? Uh, cool, yeah, so I, I think this is a good question because most of the time you're gonna get to a place either straight away or after a period of time where someone isn't gonna be prescribed specific macronutrients um, and it's probably not a long-term strategy you want everyone to follow anyway. And as you say, you're gonna come across, I would say the majority of people that actually are gonna start coaching with you probably have no idea what you're talking about if you start talking in terms of grams of a certain macronutrient. It's of no relevance for them to be able to conceptualize. So there's way, lots of ways to go about this. One is obviously that you can teach them some of those strategies of how to weigh food and log food and to be able to get an idea of their intake. That can be useful. For people who you feel that's probably not going to be a useful idea for, there's a million and one ways you can set up a dietary intervention uh, to still get them progress. So again, if we think about what are we trying to change with someone's diet that's gonna allow them to be successful, is if they're aiming to lose body fat over time, or they're just currently eating to excess right now, then we're gonna to wanna to modify their total caloric intake. We're gonna probably wanna try and prioritize how much protein they have in the diet, because it's probably pretty low right now. And overall, we probably want their food quality, let's say, to be most of the time pretty good, especially if right now they're eating just a complete diet full of processed foods all the time. So we can modify all those things without prescribing numbers of calories or numbers of protein. Um, so some guidelines might be for, for someone who's coming from a place of their diet already just being full of hyper palatable processed foods, simply shifting to more minimally processed foods is going to take care of their calorie intake anyway. They're going to naturally eat less calories. Um, for someone else, it could be prioritizing switching to more high protein based meals. So you may give them some suggestions of food sources that are particularly high in protein, try and get them to have say three to four meals across the day with a, a serving of one of these protein sources, um, make sure they're including plenty of vegetables at a couple of those main meals. And those things, again, should increase their satiety um, and maybe lead to them decreasing caloric intake overall. Um, pretty much any other strategy you can think of can work in the same way. So if you want to have a time-based restriction where someone is going to fast to a certain point in the day or has a cutoff in the evening at a certain point where they have their last meal, that's just another way of enforcing, most likely, an energy restriction without giving them a set calorie target. Um, low carb diets work the same way when someone switches to a low carb diet they end up naturally eating less calories um, and pretty much any strategy that's going to work for, for fat loss so the answer here is I would start from a place of improving their um, food quality in general if it's right now it's pretty poor and second to that having a set structure where you'll find most people tend to overeat can be in very frequent snacking that they're either subconscious of, that just adds up across the day, or mindless eating uh, late at night. So 
So having a set structure of meal timing and frequency can be useful in those cases and a kind of template of typical meals we want to suggest. Um, once they have those good quality habits in place and if they get to a certain point then where they're not progressing or their weight is staying the same, then you can start making more modifications that will reduce calories. So that could be tracking calories or it could be simply reducing the certain portion size of certain meals. It could be um, if they're having chicken, rice and vegetables at dinner, it could be halving that portion of rice and increasing the portion of vegetables. There's a million and one things we can do to make changes in their calorie intake without them necessarily knowing. Right? It could be changing from um, adding peanut butter to their yogurt to adding berries or something like that. So hopefully something in there makes sense. But yeah, there's just think to yourself of what recommendation I can give to someone that will likely decrease their caloric intake and likely getting them eating more protein. Recommend them those few simple steps one at a time. Get them following through those habits and then see if that gets them progressing. Nothing to add to that. Thank you, Danny. Question uh, number three from Matt, the Ouija warrior. Like many coaches listening to this, I got into helping others achieve results, both physical and mental progress are wins. How can we as coaches use the placebo effect to our advantage without the risk of lying, for lack of a better term, to our clients? I like this question. Do you want to have a go? Yeah. yeah. This is... In my opinion, yeah, probably one of the grey areas that exists, both in coaching and just general healthcare. Um, I'm sure good doctors uh, exercise use of the placebo effect to large degrees, um, even surgeons, things like that. My opinion can be roughly categorised as I tend to try and avoid using it or building anything of a chronic sense or founding that on a sort of a placebo effect. I'm happy to use it in an acute sense um, if a client is feeling some tightness or some pain, you know, sometimes you can convince them that if they just do a couple of sort of, you know, release or exercises with some bands or things like that, roll it out, you can... Uh, utilize the placebo to some degree there if you sell it I guess in the right way however uh, yeah I just don't try to found any of our long-standing practices on it because if they then become aware that that's what I was doing that may just reduce how much they I guess trust me how much they trust the process that we're going through yeah so use sparingly and in sort of acute senses I would suggest I'll just add really quickly to that because I agree with Lyndon. Acutely, it's not an issue, but um, looking to your values as a coach. Um, so, you know, for me, I want to do what is right, not what is easy, and act with integrity with my clients. So, um, if the use of the placebo effect violates those values, then I won't use it. Um, but if it's in line with those values, um, then I don't see. Uh, why not? And there are situations where it can be fine. As Linda mentioned, there's been many cases where I've had clients experience some pain or tightness during, you know, say an overhead press. Uh, you know, they, say they get some pinching in the traps and I'll do a little bit of release work and that's probably well outside my scope of practice. But, uh, um, you know, and I say, how does that feel now? Um, and they go, oh, yeah. And I'll actually use suggestive language. So I'll say, does that feel better now, right? And they'll say, oh yeah, it does. And they go, beautiful, try overhead press again. And they go, yeah, it feels better. And you know, I have in that sense, um, you know, helped them improve temporarily their overhead pressing um, and reduce pain. So that um, can be beneficial, but again, if that's what they're relying on long term to improve their overhead press, we've got problems. And I would generally then refer them off to you know, someone else um, to, to deal with that. So, yeah, I think there are situations where you can use it, um, especially with, um, you know, pain, because it's, it's a really complex phenomenon. Um, and, you know, sometimes we can, we can help uh, at least manage people's perception of pain uh, in the gym. Um, but outside of that, I wouldn't really use it for many other contexts. I don't know if Danny's got any thoughts. Uh, yeah, a couple. Um 
I typically am happy to let someone placebo themselves, but I don't go out of my way to tell them something I know is not true in order for me to placebo them. So as an example, if we take uh, someone that comes to me and gets has been like super excited by a particular diet, they've started eating a ketogenic diet or a gluten-free diet, and they feel really good, they, they report they've got a ton of energy, they're losing weight, they feel great on it, they, they find it easy to stick to. The difference is, for me, I'm not going to discourage them from doing it, because they're doing all the things I want them to do anyway. They're having an appropriate intake of food, they're generally eating good quality stuff, it's not hampering their life particularly in any way, and they seem to be responding well. So, for me to say, well, that's silly, you shouldn't do that, is a mistake, I would say. I'm happy to let them continue to do that. What I'm not doing, though, is telling them that the reason it's working is because a ketogenic diet is magical over something else, or that giving up gluten is the reason why they're dropping body fat. I will stop short of doing that, and if that comes up in a conversation, I'm happy to tell them, well, I don't think you need to be restricting this for X, Y, and Z. Here's something we can try. But if they are enjoying doing that, then there's no reason to break that. So for me, that's the distinguishing thing. I don't think it's useful to make up something to try and get someone to buy into it more but I think if someone is responding well to something that works for them we don't need to discourage them just because uh, we're aware of something that maybe they are not so that's typically where I would draw the line so yeah. One thing on that. Yeah. yeah the final thing I would say is there's still so much light that needs to be shed on how the placebo effect sort of just generally works like scientists are aware of it but are still very confused by it like and it shouldn't just be seen as I guess in the way we have framed it as sort of like deception or lying like at the end of the day it is still having an effect if it is helping clients yeah just be don't don't uh, yeah cast it aside straight away I think Probably Jacob's summary was very effective in how he said just if it aligns with your values, if it helps them progress, as Danny said, you don't need to purposely deceive them. Yeah, just all those things. But to, as objective, sort of scientifically aligned practitioners, as I guess our audience tends to be, it doesn't mean we need to cast aside anything that isn't completely founded either. It's just at the end of the day, having a good conceptualization of evidence-based practice I think will probably inform you to make the right decisions cool cool all very good answers uh, Laura asks we know we have to put ourselves in our clients shoes and be flexible and open to make adjustments to our procedures so that uh, they fit our clients baseline of knowledge their attitudes and behaviors specifically in regards to nutrition is there a situation in which you would say this can be taken too far or better said, how much flexibility do you allow? Uh, I presume she's talking about your systems, our systems as coaches, and how this baseline uh, of this has changed over your careers. Um, I'll quickly answer this. I won't overhaul my entire system just to fit one client. Um, I think of it like a continuum of complexity. So within my system, I'll have more complex systems and then less complex, more simple variations of that same system. And what I'll try to do is just find out where the client fits within that um, complexity spectrum. Um, but if they then don't meet the requirements of the system, even after I've tried to mold it to them as best I can, um, then perhaps it's worth having the conversation of, hey, um, you know, I need you to do this because if you're not fitting within you know, this system, which I've tried to design for you um, as best I can, then you, know, you really put me out and it makes my job and things a lot harder on my end. Um, as I'm sure you'd appreciate, you know, I don't want to put you out of your way either, so maybe we can both work together to make sure that we're meeting each other's expectations because that's what uh, you know, coaching is all about. Um, and if after that discussion there's still issues, um, it might be worth just having the conversation, you know, that it's not working, 
um, and potentially part ways. But yeah, I think if you think uh, along a spectrum of complexity with your systems, because um, generally that's where most of the issues lie, um, and you and you might need a number of different um, you know ways to go about things in each uh, you know segment of that spectrum. But if you can think of it like that, and then clients should fit uh, somewhere along there. Um, I think that's all you can really do um, outside of having to completely reinvent a system with every single client that you that you have. I think you said anything I would have said. What should I can add? I think what's important to understand here is I guess when you can compare different companies or individuals having different systems and them still all of them, or not all of them, both of them, whoever, many of them churning out great results. The reason is not because of the system itself, it's because of the person operating the system. When, or I know Jacob has a certain system that he tends to put clients through, and now that he utilizes a system because he knows where it tends to fall down, the kind of people that tend to succeed. He knows that know system just... inside out, back to front. Now, some other coach, without knowing the same things that Jacob knows, could utilise that exact same system and get extremely poor results because they don't know the things to look out for, the warning signs and things like that. So I guess the conversation that you tend to need to have with a client is, look, I'm happy to adjust my system to you, but the further we trend away from my desired system, the less expertise I have, I guess, because you have a certain system and you tend to know that quite well. And the further you are pulled away from it, from that, you still may be able to help, but you just don't know how to utilize that scenario to the best degree possible. So I guess it's about finding if there is an overlap between you and your client and just how closely you can pull them your way, how willing you are to go towards them. And again, at the end of the day, that can only be answered by the individuals in a certain situation. Yep, perfect. Uh, Washirovit asks, are there benefits of doing intermittent fasting? Autophagy, I don't even know how to pronounce Autophagy, Autophagy. I was gonna say autop, yeah. Um, improved health markers uh, is mainly by losing weight, but not the intermittent fasting itself. You're the man, Danny. Yeah. Um, Give me the mic. So, in short, I would probably hypothesize that yes, it's probably a lot of the benefits you see health-wise from an intermittent fasting protocol are due to the caloric restriction. However, it's quite difficult to tease apart whether the benefits you see with a fasting protocol happen independently of weight loss as well. So there's very few trials you can look to where you keep people weight stable and see some of these same results. For, for obvious reasons. If they're going to lose weight, you see changes in a lot of these markers anyway. So the question that I've kind of been trying to think through for quite a while and a lot of people are still trying to answer is, if we don't have weight loss, does a protocol where you include bouts of fasting have inherent health benefits over one that doesn't have bouts of fasting? Um, in, we don't have an answer, conclusively in humans at least right now. I think there, most of the data is in, in animal models. Some started in, in humans now with time-restricted feeding models and so on. Um, we're starting to put some of this together, but I don't think there's a definitive answer and to what extent you'd see those benefits over, a, let's say, a non-fasting protocol. My a guess would be that there is benefit to having periods of time where you have complete energy restriction yeah. so the problem is we don't know how long that energy restriction should be how many hours slash days that needs to be what frequency that needs to be in so if you were to think of this as if it were a drug we, we don't know the dosage or the frequency to give this so right now it's a lot of people doing trial and error to see what works um, the, the from a practical stance the thing I tend to say to people is when it comes down to fasting and they ask about should I be targeting something to increase autophagy or targeting some of these other things that they've heard fasting help, helps promote, is this a good thing? Then in general I would say to them that you can get all those benefits regardless of the mechanism. And by that if someone is using a fasting protocol 
as their means of caloric restriction or reducing their eating window or having a meal frequency that's more, let's say, in line with their circadian rhythms and there's a whole host of things we can get into, that the um, you can, I suppose, reach those targets without necessarily knowing the mechanism just yet. So in, I think, in short, to answer the question, I suspect there may be some slight benefits, but most of the benefit you see from fasting protocols is due to the caloric uh, restriction it induces. Um, and then on a separate note, I kind of have a soft spot for some time-restricted feeding that is in line with circadian biology, but that's tiny, tiny, minute detail that most people don't need to worry about with a new client, for example. So I think that answers yeah. what I think. I'm not even going to bother. Do you want to? I just want to say one thing. With yeah, again, completely agree with everything Danny said. Um, something to consider, however, at least the way that I think about physiology. And Danny's probably going to punch me in the back of the head if he hears me say physiology one more time this weekend. Um, <laughs> the way I view it, if there's a difference, there tends to be a difference. Like, while it is a fantastic movement that tends to exist that it's sort of it's net averages over time it doesn't matter if you achieve your you know, 3,000 calorie deficit across the week in you know a number of days or across the week or however you go about it your deficit across the day whether you spread out your meals or eat them all in a condensed period however I tend to be of the opinion if there is a different if there is a difference in methodologies there tends to be a difference in outcomes and the reason that we can't pick them up is they tend they tend to be very small differences so as Danny said they it like you may have to study thousands and thousands of people before we start to pick up these differences they may exist and just because we haven't detected them so far doesn't mean they don't or we may just be looking at the wrong outcomes like we may be measuring things or failing to measure things where the differences do actually exist. So I think for 99% of the answer, it's mostly going to be calorie deficit, weight related and things like that. But there may be things that we are missing and it just depends how sort of, how you want to think about it for your own practice, I think at the end of the day. And yeah. yeah, I'll just add one thing just because I was talking about something similar yesterday with someone, uh, the whole area of chrononutrition, which is, again, something that's kind of more on the edge of research now, of eating at specific times that are more in sync with your circadian rhythms, uh, essentially. Um, and without getting into that, the kind of punchline that I, I gave to that person is that I do suspect that there is a difference. I do think that there is good literature to suggest that meal timing actually does matter uh, both in the consistency of your meal times on a day-to-day basis and also let's say whether you eat a the same meal during the middle of the day versus during the middle of the night I think your metabolism works differently there but my kind of takeaway for in practice is you have to consider what is the net effect of recommending something that to a client so why do we not typically go out and start shouting to most clients you have to eat these specific times a day you have to not eat after this hour is because there are bigger pieces of the puzzle that matter more so your overall caloric intake still matters more Uh, your body fat levels still matter more your probably daily protein intake and distribution matters more than some of these things most likely uh, to improve someone's body composition there for their health so you can maybe make a change that would optimize this for a circadian biology perspective, but that either decreases someone's uh, compliance with the diet and therefore they actually end up not eating a proper amount of calories, it induces too much stress and anxiety, they can't go to now social occasions out with their family, they can't have dinner in the evening with their family, and all these types of things that will have negative implications for their health just because they're trying to chase this small thing that we're still not too sure, but I think suspect has a difference. And so that's what I'd say. If they're doing everything else right, and we say, yeah, can some degree of fasting be beneficial for their health, then that's something they can try. But if by trying to fast, it makes everything else more difficult, the big picture stuff, then it's probably not worth that trade-off. And so that's the way I typically frame it.
Awesome. Spazimira asks, fat distribution across the day, how important is fat intake for breakfast, pre-workout, post-workout, etc.? Danny? Probably not important at all for virtually most people. The only real major consideration to think of right now is in any case where you would want increased gastric emptying, so how fast you process those nutrients. Probably the only people you're thinking about here is athletes who train multiple times per day um, for the simple reason that you have a shortened window to restore glycogen between training sessions. Uh, if you have a time restriction on how much uh, or the, the ability to restore glycogen, you want to obviously do that as fast as possible. You want to refeed carbohydrates after that first training session. If you have a large dose of fat with that meal, it will just slow the digestion time for that to happen and so may, to some degree, decrease how much glycogen they can uh, restore before their next training. Now that's obviously depending on those sessions being demanding for glucose, um, so the type of athlete they are and so on. Um, so yeah, if it's an athlete with multiple sessions per day and you're focusing on glycogen restoration, you probably wanna have a fast digesting high carb meal with little fat. Um, apart from that, there's probably not too many cases where you need to worry about the fat dose per meal as opposed to just your overall fat intake across the day and the sources it's coming from or at least I can't think of anything off the top of my head right now yeah I would just yeah I would just say Danny is again completely right um, the thing that I tend to try to look at these questions through is while fat may not or your fat distribution across the day may not matter yeah as Danny said the way food is sitting in your stomach may affect your training session and then that matters so it's sort of just seeing how these variables play into one another and I, I have seen a few too many people probably disrupt their training by just feeling like oh now that I'm in a bulking phase and I got so much higher calories to play with. They start having like donuts for pre-workout, then their training goes to goes to rubbish, and like it clearly then does matter in that case. Um, so it's in a very reasonable approach. It's really not going to matter. And if you've only got sort of 60 grams of fat to play with across the day, but if you're a high end and a gaining phase, and food is already starting to sit in your stomach more and more, it you may need to tend to be more careful with just how you distribute fat and I tend to try to steer clients a little more towards just for practical purposes sort of bookmarking or bookending their day with their fatter their higher fat meals sort of the start of the day and at the end of the day and that is not for sort of scientific but more just practical reasons I guess yeah cool I think both very good answers uh, Chris asks uh, his question is in relation to the mental and emotional aspect of weight loss. Uh, so we all know calories in versus calories out is ultimately the crux of weight loss and gain. And he feels that people are more aware of the science and are becoming more educated and generally know right from wrong. Uh, there are years of certain lifestyle, emotional attachments to food and eating and the mental challenges attached uh, that can be forgotten when a fitness professional uh, sets a diet plan and he wants to know what our role is as coaches if we aren't trained psychologists and what are our thoughts on these situations. Yeah, so it depends on the degree we're talking about. Like you say, if it's a true issue where they need to be in contact with a professional, we can always refer out. Um, if it's simply more asking about, um, or at least how the question is framed, it seems like, for those that are interested in fitness and nutrition, we are coming at this with a very different perspective and certain behaviors can seem like they're easier or more automatic to us than to someone else. And I think that's a absolutely correct and it's certainly uh, worth noting. And I think the answer to this is generally how I try and think through what's the most important aspect for coaching and it's empathy. And if you are able to exert empathy with a client that is being able to listen to what they're reporting to you in a non-judgmental way that, that then you are trying to think through 
from what perspective they are seeing this. So not only that they're not following something, but instead of getting frustrated with that of trying to realize, well, what experiences do, may they have that may explain some of this? And from there, there's, I mean, there's probably a few ways you can go. You can try and set up um, targets and behaviors for them to follow that might take care of it, or it could be a matter of education around um, getting them up to speed on a certain area. I don't know if there's one kind of tactic or answer to this real question. Um, I don't know if the, what the kind of main question coming out actually was. Uh, but if it's like what to do with if someone is, if we're not in the same position as them, is mm. try and place ourselves in that position yeah. as them. How to deal so, with emotional yeah. eating and stuff like that as well. Right, yeah, so I mean, this can be, a, again, this is deep areas and for people that are really embedded in any type of disordered eating or um, anything like that, referring on. Um, and again, the rest is case by case based. So I'm not sure I can give a, a catch all thing of this is what you do if someone has a certain relationship with food. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is a tricky situation. I think we. We need to be really careful about what advice and recommendations we give you guys on topics like this because it is context dependent and generally uh, psychologists uh, will need to deal with these kind of things. Uh, but I think helping your clients become more self-aware um, can definitely help improve just how they manage themselves um, and understand why they feel certain things, why they think certain things, and that can really just help them improve their decision making. Um, because if people act on emotions, generally they're not thinking objectively, clearly, they're not rational or using logic, um, because emotion is purely trying to satisfy uh, the immediate needs of that person to you know, restore their function and well-being, right? Um, so I think if we can just help our clients learn more about themselves and at least avoid situations that tend to create these emotional issues around their food, whether, um, you know, whether it's feeling lonely at home and they you know, pick up some ice cream and eat it, getting them to call someone late at night when they feel lonely instead of um, you know, eating ice cream or real, teaching them that being alone is okay, for example, and that they don't need to always be with someone for whatever reason um, can help. Um, but yeah, I just think that's probably my only suggestion. Yeah, just as we were saying, I have a few things that, that might work from a practical standpoint. Um, and again, I'm not a psychologist, but these are things that may be useful in those contexts. If it's something like emotional eating or they have a behavior of, like you said, they get upset or when they're alone, they will resort to a certain thing. Um, a strategy you can try and work with them is something called an implementation intention. So this is essentially a, a case of an, uh, if then, uh, then that, right? So it's like if, so they can write these out, if X happens, then my response will be this. And so you're planning ahead of time. So if I get upset, then this is how my response is gonna be. So you, you are essentially putting on autopilot. They already know what they should do if a certain scenario that usually triggers them to eat or not follow through with a plan happens. They can now work their way through this by going, okay, if this happens, then this is my just automatic response. And it's just a thing to do. Uh, that might be useful. And then the other thing is probably realizing that we talk a lot about like lifestyle change and a lot of that is tied to someone's identity so rather than trying to change the foods they eat in a vacuum and nothing else around that changes it almost takes a complete lifestyle change in how that person sees themselves so they can't just be the in the same scenario as the same person they were and just try and now eat a ton of healthy foods versus not they almost have to see themselves as the person that eats this a certain way the person that exercises five days a week the person that has this type of lifestyle and the more you can tie someone's identity to those things the the more as likelihood you have of them actually following through with it i guess so there's some things i thought yeah that, that was exactly what i was alluding to uh, with implementation strategies and one that i have really commonly is like stress um, and, and emotional eating because of stress. So um, 
I've had many clients experience similar thing. They have a really bad day at work. They get highly stressed. Uh, these general population clients, and they go home and they they eat and they you know overindulge and so on and so forth. So you know I've given clients to give a real practical example, uh, a strategy to implement before they get home to manage the stress, um, and and that's been really useful. So that's just one example. Um, and on the identity thing, what I've done in practice with a lot of my clients, which Again, I, I haven't gone looking for research on this, but I'm sure I could probably find some because you can find research pretty much support anything, um, is the use of positive affirmations, things like vision boards and just, um, you know, uh, journaling, um, you know, thoughts and stuff to help change someone's identity and getting them to affirm to themselves that they are, you know, this person who exercises, who uh, respects their body, all these sorts of things. Um, because yeah, just I think telling people to do that without giving them um, strategies can sometimes, yeah, people don't implement it or take it on board. Um, but I think that's super important as well, like Danny said. Anything else? Cool. Um, 